Hello and welcome to another DC Today, a daily synopsis for you of all the fun action in the market. Uh, we're getting even closer now, just three days to go now, to the close of September and Q3, uh, likely a quarter and a month uh, that a lot of people will want to leave in the rearview mirror. The Dow ended up down 126 points today. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal these days, but it was up over 300 early on. Right away, it was clear it wasn't going to hold its momentum. And so the Dow, after a couple of hours, had gone from positive to negative. But even the high of the day was reached very early on, and that upward momentum uh, fizzled quite early on. The S&P um, was down 0.21%. Uh, the Dow was down, <clears throat> excuse me, 0.4%. The NASDAQ was up a tiny bit. So a little bit of a mixed bag there. But the bigger story, just by far, and it's driving everything else going on right now, is the upward surge in bond yields. And the 10-year was up seven basis points today. I want to I give you, I know that the five-year closed at 4.2%. But to give you an idea of some of the weird action in the bond market today, you had the two-year down a couple basis points. You had the six-month down six basis points. And then you have the 10-year, like I say, up seven basis points and the 30-year up 13. That's uh, quite a bit of steepening in the yield curve when yields in the low end were coming down, and the high end going up. And it's just been so long since we've seen something like that. So a little steepening in the curve. But fundamentally, actually, let me get through the data and then I'm going to give you some commentary on why this matters because it matters a lot. Energy was the top performing sector today. It was up about 1.2%. Uh, consumer staples were the worst performing sector. They were down about 1.7. And it was kind of a mixed bag among sectors in between. WTI uh, was up. The crude oil was up 2.3%, but it's still sitting there just below $80. So um, oil was up today, but has it's, it's been uh, down uh, quite a bit here over the last couple of months. And there you go. That's kind of the summary of today's market. Look, um, the dollar strengthening and what you've seen in the last week versus the sterling pound um, get, you know, massive rally bringing the sterling down and the dollar up. Same thing with yen um, to a lesser degree with uh, Chinese yuan. Uh, but the dollar strength is the story, and that is uh, a correlated story to the surge in bond yields. <clears throat> when bond yields drop, equities will go higher. When the dollar reverses, equities will go higher. Uh, until those things happen, um, I don't think they will. And it's really that simple right now. So uh, some kind of snapback in bond yields and the dollar could happen in five minutes and it could happen in five weeks. Uh, it, it, my, I'm not offering you anything helpful here about timing a trade, but I'm in offering an indicator of what uh, is a catalyst to seeing some buyers come back into the equity space. And that's the huge issue. Well, that gets to the heart of the matter on the bond side. And I want to think through this more and I'm in touch with several people that I talk to every day or very frequently macroeconomically, I am increasingly of the opinion that the Fed may not touch the Fed funds rate as a means of uh, lighting up, lightening up on monetary tightening, but that they will indeed be lightening up. And so what do I mean by that? It's quantitative tightening. The issue of the Fed reducing their balance sheet I find it impossible to believe right now that it is not a major factor in the upward move in the long end of the curve. And what uh, the Fed has done is, just to use back a napkin math for you, they added about $4 trillion to their balance sheet after financial crisis. They got a few hundred billion off when they were tightening before. Eventually, they broke credit markets and then they stopped. And then they just ran, ran still. They weren't easing, quantitative easing, QE. They weren't easing or tightening. Then COVID came and they added another $4 trillion. It was a little more. 
uh, with some degree of mortgage-backed securities, Fannie and Freddie bonds, and a much higher degree of treasury bonds. And so then they announced, okay, we're going to start tightening up. We're going to start pulling liquidity out of the banking system. And we're going to do this by allowing $47.5 billion a month of um, government securities to mature and not be reinvested. And so essentially that was a way without selling bonds of reducing the balance sheet. But they said in September they were going to double that amount up to $95 billion a month. So let's call it, you know, rounding up $100 billion a month that they're going to be reducing the balance sheet. Uh, I, it appears to me that there are no buyers. The five-year auction today um, finally got filled three basis points higher than where they came out at and, and when issued. And so you're talking about a 4.2 yield on the five-year. Um, there's still inversion between the middle of that curve and when you get out to 10 and 30. Um, I, I just simply believe that it is a plausible theory that the Fed can keep talking the way they're talking and allow the Fed funds rate to go in the direction they're, they're referring to. But then on the other side, which would not be as subject to political backlash or some of the same accusatory uh, environment they would in inherit if they reverse direction on rates, um, soften up on the quantitative tightening. And I wouldn't be acting on this theory, but I would put it out there as a not small chance of something that could play out in the weeks and months to come, uh, which could be relevant to investors when they think about how markets are presently responding to liquidity conditions. So if this seems a bit confusing, you have to let me know, but I don't think it is. I'm effectively saying that there's two ways the Fed can keep tightening and they've committed to doing both. And there's two ways they could go about trying to um, accommodate or, or introduce more loose and easy monetary policy. And one of those two ways is going to be very tricky to uh, maintaining credibility. And that would be to all of a sudden start cutting rates. But perhaps what they could do is reverse their commitment to quantitative tightening in a way that allows the long end to kind of uh, come back in, and it would probably bring in the mid-range uh, belly of the yield curve as well. That adds financial, um, uh, it improves financial conditions, it adds liquidity in the banking system, it dethaws some of what is starting to get frozen up in credit markets, and then allows the Fed to say, oh yeah, we're really out fighting inflation and we're raising rates and all those things. I'm throwing that out there as a working theory, and I have more research and thoughts to do. Um, as to where I may be missing, what I may be wrong about, but I wanted to share it real time with you. Quanti uh, economic data, and then I'll let you go. Consumer confidence came in higher than expected today, 108 versus 104. Um, some of that probably t correlated to gas prices having dropped. Core durable goods were up 1.3% of the month. Really solid new orders on electronics, computers, auto parts, components. Um, good data on the durable goods, core dur durable goods today. House prices, not as much. The uh, S&P core logic that, that follows some of the major markets of the country, still up 15.8% versus a year ago. But um, you had month over month decline in prices here in Orange County, California. You reported a monthly decline in average prices. People always say Orange County can't go down. They shall find out. Uh, but we were at 18.1% year over year in this uh, core logic S&P index, and now it came to 15.8. So you're seeing some disinflation in that insane price inflation that was taking place in house prices. The best performing uh, markets, if you will, meaning where house price appreciation was highest on the month was still Tampa, Miami, Dallas, and Charlotte. I can't even imagine what is the uh, aspects driving home price appreciation there? And then the worst performing of major metropolitan areas were Minneapolis, Washington, D.C., 
in San Francisco. And again, I'm just at a total loss to figure out what that may be about. I'm not going to say that I'm being sarcastic. I'm just going to expect you to follow me. That's the scoop here. Futures haven't opened up yet, so I can't dig in to where we are pre-market. We'll see where things go the next three days. Bottom line, I want to reiterate this. Markets go up and down. Uh, Dividends go up. Keep that in mind. Thanks for listening to and watching the DC Today.